So Francis isn't just a plastic cast saint. It, so far we've looked at his personality, quite ego-driven and also a lover of fashion. And also he put a lot of emphasis on what other people thought of him. So he, he appeared quite vain, quite vain. But now it's slowly being taken from him and he's facing his greatest fears of having to detach himself from the world, detach himself from a family who have a lot of clout, as we say today, and those expensive linens and clothes and a pretty good future. One such banquet is widely discussed by his biographers. After they had eaten and drink plenty, the young men elected Francis, but he wasn't having it. They pushed him, shoved him, coerced him. No. But his companions quickly realised that Francis, rather than the rebel rouser they were used to, was clearly only going through the motions. His heart was somewhere else. But where was it? According to Solano, he said, I shall marry a nobler and lovelier bride than you have ever seen. One who surpasses all others in beauty and excels them all in wisdom. This was indeed an odd reply because as far as his parents knew, there was no special woman in Francis' life. Hmm and the topic of marriage had never cropped up in any family conversation. It was Francis, at his most obtuse. His bride was to be what he called Lady Poverty. Now this is the first reference so far to Lady Poverty. This was his bride, his spiritual bride. Lady Poverty. As one biographer puts it, no bride was ever wooed with more eagerness and persistence than Frances wooed the Lady Poverty. The banquet and conversation about marriage mark a further stepping stone in Frances' path towards developing a living relationship with God, a living face with his God. Franciscan pilgrimage leader Rock Neimer emphasizes the significance of the occasion. This is a moment of God introducing himself to Francis. It might be helpful to note that, did, that this did not take place in a church, nor while on a retreat or a pilgrimage. It is not even something that Francis pursued or sought. Rather, it took place during a party, a celebration. It was something totally unexpected, a free gift. He did nothing to earn it or make it happen. So what is this? Francis realized that he was being called by God to embrace poverty, to marry Lady Poverty, and live a life based on pleasing God rather than pleasing himself. As O.K. puts it, the hand of the Lord was upon him. His great journey had begun. He decided that he needed to find somewhere away from the hustle and bustle of town life in Assisi, where he could spend time alone in prayer, seeking guidance from God about what he was being called to do. Because up until now, Francis had no idea because he didn't have any aspirations to set up a church, a monastic order. These were far from his mind. 
he found the peace he needed in a small cave near Assisi, where he would go regularly. And as Solano puts it, his earnest prayer was that the eternal and true God should guide his footsteps and teach him to do his will. He suffered great mental anguish and could not rest until he put into action what he had conceived in his heart. But the great Bonaventure tells us of how from that time he awaited in obedience the revelation of the will of God. And we come to the turning point. By 1205, we find Francis at a difficult point in his life, convinced at last that his destiny was not to become a noble knight, but yet unsure what the future held for him. This uncertainty was soon to change and in a most unexpected way. Some find it difficult to make sense of what happened next to Francis. For example, Chesterton notes that something happened to him that must remain greatly dark to most of us who are ordinary and selfish men whom God has not broken to make new to make a new, implying that most of us will never be able to understand what happened to Francis because we are so far removed from him spiritually. But to Francis the message and its meaning were crystal clear. It was one of the most transformational events in his life and it was to have a lasting impact on him and marks a significant turning point in his journey through life and into faith. It took place just outside Assisi in the autumn of 1205 when he was 23 years old. The place, San Damiano. One day Francis was walking back to Assisi after one of his regular walks to the surrounding countryside. Increasingly, he enjoyed his own company, as I do, and he liked the peace and quiet of these walks, which gave him time to think and space away from peer pressure and his father's influence. He decided to stop for a while at the tiny ruined chapel of San Damiano, or in English, St. Damien's, about a mile south of the city walls. It was in a clearing in the woods, surrounded by a meadow. A small wayside church was built of rough stone on the site in the early 11th century, and in Francis' day, it belonged to the Cathedral of San Rufino, it was probably a chantry chapel in which a priest would be retained to pray for the soul of a departed benefactor or their loved one. A tiny priest's house had been built against its walls. The church had long been largely abandoned and was literally falling down. Excuse me. The story of Francis really captivates my heart. I've just finished reading the book and I, and I just feel here. I, I'm almost choking with an overwhelming sense of humility at what he suffered, at what he suffered towards the end of his life. And it is a beautiful story. So forgive me, I'm having a deja vu. Despite the decay, this unsuming and largely forgotten church was to play a formative role in shaping the rest of Francis' life. This space and place became vitally important to Francis, as Chesterton puts it. 
during these dark and aimless days of transition that followed the tragic collapse of all his military ambitions, possibly made bitter by some loss of social prestige, terrible to his sensitive spirit. So here we're, we're discovering something about Francis. We're discovering that he has a sensitive nature, but he also is prone to egoism. And can you see the hand of God here? Because I know from my own journey that you have to be broken in your mind, in your ego. Your aspirations for earthly success have to be crushed so that the Spirit of God within you can come forward into fruition. You may not agree with that, but for God to use his children, he has to make sure that we're devoid of ego. Because ego, it spoils everything for God. It really does. Francis' story centers on the wooden cross over the altar, which was painted in red, gold and blue. It did not represent the tortured Christ of later art, but the large open dark eyes of the crucified looked down with a haunted vividness. It was a striking example of the early painted crucifixes, painted on linen, stretched, taut over a walnut frame. It was a striking image in the tradition of Syrian-influenced 12th century iconography, the eyes of Christ gaining serenely and directly towards the viewer. Wow! It shows a thin Christ with a kindly face, a well-kept beard and shoulder-length hair. He is shown nailed by his hands and feet to a highly decorated cross, wearing only a simple white loincloth tied at the waist with a cord. Behind him are painted scenes of richly dressed figures. The whole image is balanced and warm but the eye is drawn immediately to the central figure, the Christ. He looks serene, gazing out from his crucifixion. The restored crucifix now hangs in a chapel in the Basilica of St. Clair in Assisi, and I was very privileged to see that when I went to Assisi to hear what Francis asked me to do in 2008. And I was also privileged to see the remains of St. Clair, who was embalmed in the crypt. Absolutely unforgettable. Francis had visited San Damiano many times before in search of solitude. He loved the peace and the quiet, which offered him a place to think, reflect and pray sitting or kneeling on the floor. He had spent many hours there, but this time was different. The cross was a familiar sight, but he looked on at, he looked on it as if for the first time, seeing it in a radically different way. It suddenly had a very different meaning. Previously, it was something to focus his prayers on. A prop almost, but now it spoke to him, both figuratively and literally. For the first time alone before the cross, Francis realized that what it said in the Bible about Jesus' death on the cross was true. It had really happened. And for the reasons given, he realized that Jesus God's beloved Son, who had lived a good life without sin, had been crucified on the cross in place of other people. Let's reflect there. Let's just reflect and just connect with our heart. And let us just embrace the meaning of what is being said to your heart and mine. And I show you now the icon 